This video is made possible by Practical Defense Systems, the best online security training at the lowest prices. You can start your security career today online at pdsclasses.com. Check them out. Hi, this is Joel Persinger. I'm the Gun Guy. Thank you very much for all of your support of Gun Guy TV. I really do deeply appreciate it. You may want to check out the Gun Guy TV Firearms Podcast. It comes out on the 5th and the 20th, and then we do post it sometimes a couple of days after that on the various video channels, so you can check it out there. And I do encourage you to check us out on the various video channels that we have, because sometimes YouTube can be a little iffy and, you know, maybe they keep us here and maybe they don't. So you might want to subscribe on one of those other places as well, just in case something happens to us here on YouTube. I had an opportunity this morning to sit down with Eric Pratt from Gun Owners of America. Eric is just a terrific guy. He's incredibly knowledgeable, and I am very supportive of GOA, so I urge you to support them as well. We had a long talk about what's going on during the COVID-19 uh, Chinese virus thing and all the various battles that are going on in the background you may not know about because the mainstream media doesn't bother to tell you. So uh, I urge you to watch the entire interview. I realize it's a little long, but it's very informative. So let's uh, let's get right into it. Here's the interview. Uh, Eric, thank you very much for joining me. I really appreciate you a lot, and I appreciate what you guys do a lot. In fact, before we even get started, I have to I have to confess something here because I really screwed something up. The other day, I did a video, and you had you were kind enough to send me a hat. So let me get my hat. Hold on. You were kind enough to send me this hat. In fact, I got two. So I gave one to my wife because I think my wife is also a life member of, of uh, GOA. And on the side, it says Thank life you. member. And I put it on my head and it went like this. <laughs> <laughs> and I, okay. So, and I thought I tried to adjust it and I couldn't adjust it. And I thought, well, you know, it's it either my, either the hat is small or I've got a fat head, one of the two. And so I jokingly said, Hey, Jordan or uh, Eric, if you happen to see the video and you want to send me a hat that fits, I'll wear it. Uh, during my show because I want to support GOA. Well, lo and behold, what I discovered is even though I am a man who is officially a senior citizen, <laughs> I obviously don't know how to adjust that ball cap. <laughs> okay, so my wife. Uh, I'm glad you got it figured out. It looks my great. My wife takes the ball cap and she goes, oh, well, you just do. That's so, hysterical. For well, the record, what would we do without our wives, right? It's I obviously fantastic. wouldn't have a hat to wear, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but now I do. So there you are, GOA right there. And, uh, you know, if you saw the previous video, it is not Eric's fault. It's not GOA's fault. It was pilot error, operator error. Uh, one, and now, just for the record, at my ripe old age in my 60s, I now know how to adjust a ball cap. You know, a lifetime. Never learner. too late. That's right. <laughs> I'm a lifetime learner. Well, there's a bunch of stuff to talk about. Um, among them are the obvious Something you and I were talking about a couple minutes ago off uh, off camera is that while there's it seems like there's a million news stories right now about everything coronavirus or Chinese virus or Wuhan virus or COVID-19 or whatever you want to call it, the politicians in the background are doing everything they can, it seems, to destroy our Second Amendment rights in the process. Among them are all of these battles going on with gun stores. What kind of where, where do we stand with that? Is that still going on? Well, it is still uh, a threat and it is going on. And by the way, thank you so much for, for having me back. It's great to be with you, Joel. Um, you know, first I should say that there's, uh, in, in the midst of all this, there's been good news and uh, you may have uh, reported on this already, but uh, with the Department of Homeland Security issuing a revision of uh, what is an essential business. I mean, originally they didn't have gun stores or gun ranges listed. So Gun Owners of America and Gun Owners of California uh, sent a letter to the administration uh, urging them to revise that list. They did. And that had a huge ripple effect across the country. Uh, I know the L.A. County, Los Angeles County has been back and forth a zillion times. But based on uh, that Depar Department of Homeland Security revision, uh, they reversed themselves, said, OK, gun stores are uh, essential businesses. The the um, governor of New Jersey uh, reversed himself and uh, you know, said the same thing. Uh, we took those revisions and used it in North Carolina because you know, even though North Carolina is typically a red state, a, a pro-gun state, there were several localities that had banned uh, and, and closed down gun stores. 
And so we use that letter very effectively, or, or uh, th that uh, the, the revised guidance very effectively sent letters threatening lawsuits to several mayors, several board of county supervisors uh, all across the state. And every single one of them, uh, without fault, ended up reversing themselves and declared that uh, gun stores uh, can remain open. In fact, we've got one article reporting on this uh, on our website at gunowners.org. It's rather uh, comical, uh, obviously written by a leftist, and they're just lamenting uh, what, what happened in North Carolina with all these uh, localities reversing themselves and and the title of the article was the gun nuts one and they talk about what we did in conjunction with grassroots North Carolina um, to, uh, to to get these uh, localities to to reverse themselves in fact they, they quote one mayor as saying you know th this this is what happens uh, you know when the gun lobby gets involved and it's just disgusting and uh, we knew we were gonna have to pay their attorney's fees. So we just decided what the heck we're going to, you know, we're going to go ahead and open gun stores, but it's terrible that we have to do this. I mean, never mind that, uh, you know, they're completely violating uh, the Bill of Rights. I mean, it's interesting, uh, the governor of New Jersey not too long ago saying he didn't consider the Bill of Rights when uh, issuing uh, his orders uh, there in the state. I mean, what, what, what's happening across the country, and this is what you were alluding to, there's still several battlegrounds where we're still fighting this. Uh, New Hampshire, uh, Washington, Massachusetts, Virginia, and, and we're involved in every single one uh, of these states. Uh, but it's just an ongoing battle, and, and everyone, as you know, to a T, uh, has a Democrat governor. I mean, they are the, the anti-gun party. Very few pro-gun Democrats left, certainly at, at the national level. Uh, if uh, at the state level, you may you find a few, but uh, you know, the ones that are elected to statewide office, I mean, they just use this as an opportunity. The old adage, never let a crisis go, into, uh, go to waste. Uh, but, you know, we're fighting them every step of the way. We do have lawsuits right now pending in uh, Virginia and Massachusetts where we're uh, fighting the governors of those states in regard to the shutdowns of gun ranges or gun stores. It's an amazing thing to me how, oh, you've got caught. Hold on. I have coffee. Now, what I don't have <laughs> is a Gun Owners of America coffee cup like you've got, but I'll I'll buy one. Hey, there. We will fix that right away. All right. I'll have the hat, and next time I'll be I'll be properly equipped. Obviously, I'm not here, but <laughs> I do have a I do have a nice cup, but it came from Bass Pro Shop. I'm sorry, uh, but I need a GOA cup. I will use that absolutely. You know, it, it's astounding to me how absolutely in lockstep the media is with the governors, because it seems like they hide these stories in the, it, you really have to search for them. You have to look on gun centric type websites or, or go to the GOA website to find these, the infringements because they just don't pop up in the mainstream news at all. Or am I missing something? No, you have to look hard. Uh, you certainly do. And and even if you find them, what you won't see them reporting, uh, you know, the media, they, they love to always tell you what the lesson is that you're supposed to learn from whatever crisis is going on. Of course, it's always a lesson from their leftist perspective. But what you're not going to hear is really the, the real lesson of all of this is this is what's wrong with the whole permission system that we have allowed to be applied to the Second Amendment. Of course, GOA has fought this all along. Uh, but, you know, this is the problem with background checks. I mean, Gun Owners of America has opposed uh, the NIC system, uh, the Brady Law, from its inception. But, I mean, here we're seeing with the, uh, the huge outpouring uh, of support and people going and, and purchasing firearms, uh, a lot of first-time gun buyers who are liberal and, and anti-gun, uh, but it, it is so overburdened the system. There's delays, there's mistakes. And, uh, and so what you see is, you know, people are going to end up being endangered when their, their most basic right is being infringed and delayed. And I, I think it really shows the problems with why we shouldn't have a permission system with what other rights do we tolerate this where, you know, you don't require people to get permission before they preach a sermon or get married or have children, you know, something which is a God-given right. We shouldn't have to ask a bureaucrat uh, to, to, you know, if you give a bureaucrat a chance to 
uh, to say no, they will. And, uh, you know, and so not only are there abuses of the system, but then there's also the, the overburdening of the system that can result in such a, uh, a, a real problem. I, I mentioned the irony, a lot of first time gun buyers uh, they're actually outraged, uh, and there have been a couple of articles on this, how people are just outraged, uh, specifically the first-time gun buyers. In some places, it's, uh, they're saying 60% of the, the gun sales are, are first-time buyers, and many of them uh, previously anti-gun, liberal, and they're outraged because you know, all their, some of these have, have uh, mentioned you know, they were told all their life it's easier to get a gun than an abortion. And they're finding out that's not the case. Uh, many have said that they saw on TV that it's so easy to buy a gun, and yet here they're having to fill out all this federal paperwork and, you know, get registered and all this, and they're frustrated and angry. Well, welcome to our world, right, Joel? I mean, yeah. this is a very reason, you know, I mean, they, they can actually be thankful uh, that uh, there have been gun rights groups that have been fighting uh, these laws all along, or quite frankly, it might have been impossible. Uh, it, it, you know, one of the, the laughable things is, because, and, but see here again, it's because they, they hear uh, what the media says or what's, uh, you know, what they see portrayed on TV. A lot of them thought they could just order a gun online and have it shipped to their, their doorstep. Uh, you know, and all along we've been saying, you can't do that. No. <laughs> uh, but, but, but the left just continues to, you know, uh, portray that mantra. Uh, uh, you know, to spread that mantra. And so, of course, you know, people believe it. And so they're outraged when they need a gun in a hurry and uh, they, they can't do it. By the way, I, I should say, you know, you Californians know all about the problems with the background check system. I mean, my goodness, the new law that went into effect, uh, I think it was last year, right, requiring yeah. background checks on ammo sales and just what a disaster it has been. Tens of thousands of people have been wrongfully denied uh, just through ineptitude, eh, probably a lot of error. But, you know, this is the kind of thing we've seen at the federal level. Uh, at the federal level, we don't have background checks on, on ammunition, obviously, but just in, in terms of purchasing firearms, 90% of initial denials are false positives. So, you know, we've seen these infringements, and this is why Gun Owners of America is working so hard uh, to, to push these back and to, to repeal laws like the Brady Law. Well, you know, anytime you consign the ability to exercise your right to a department of the government, which mirrors the DMV, you're going to have a serious problem. <laughs> if you've ever walked into a department of motor vehicles or department of transportation in any state, I don't care where, you now know what you're dealing with when you're trying to buy a firearm in the United States and you've consigned your rights to an organization like that. That's the reason why we have the problem that we have. Uh, one of the things I noticed that they're trying to do now, too, is push the vote by mail thing. You mentioned us yeah. in California, the vote by mail and the ballot harvesting deal. Well, I'm going to tell you right now that that is a disaster looking for a place to happen. We've dealt with that in California for, I, I think, this last election. The Anything conservative got totally creamed by the ballot harvesting issue. In fact, we had a couple of instances where we had total victory on the part of a, of a uh, U.S. House member who was ahead, one in, in one case, ahead by 5,000 votes. And then after the election is called and over, they went and harvested ballots, a third-party organization, and came and said, oh, we found these. And that individual lost by five or 600 votes. Hmm. That's what the Democrats and that's what the anti-gunners want to do now nationally. Do you think that really is, is that a threat to our rights? Uh, it's absolutely a threat. Uh, you've just outlined uh, some of the problems that you guys have seen in California. Um, ironically, uh, you know, I don't think there was ever in, in any way I shared any agreement with former President Jimmy Carter, uh, but he uh, helped commission a study uh, back uh, you know, about 10, 15 years ago, and he uh, was uh, part of the, the study heads that concluded that mail-in ballots are the greatest potential for fraud in our election system. Uh, and he's absolutely right on that. And, and uh, you know, you've given uh, some examples of what's happened in California. And now they're trying to spread that nationally. They're using the whole COVID-19 epidemic and the scare uh, and, and the, the relief funding for that. And they're trying to jam-pack 
uh, that bill with all kinds of liberal goodies, including mail-in ballots. That's one of the threats that actually Gun Owners of America is fighting because we know that if, you know, the, one of the greatest protections we have to help preserve our Second Amendment is the fact that we have free elections. But if you take that away, and, and by the way, uh, the way it works out, I mean, you, you just, you, you go look at the evidence, uh, mail-in ballots favor uh, anti-gun Democrats uh, because they're willing to lie, cheat, and steal uh, to get their candidates elected. And I'm not saying that it can't happen on the Republican side, uh, but when, you know, when you're a party that uh, will not respect the ultimate law that we have in this country, which is the Constitution, and you'll say things like, uh, you know, Murphy, Governor Murphy of New Jersey, uh, you know, I didn't even consider the Bill of Rights. Uh, and, and as a party, that they certainly don't when it comes to the Second Amendment and many other parts. Well, why should you consider uh, morality in terms of, uh, you know, the, the, the whole election process? I mean, in their minds, it's all for the greater good if it's getting their party in power. And so, uh, yeah, this is a real threat. Um, we, uh, Gun Owners of America, activated our list, and we were able to generate 1 million email messages uh, to Republican wow. senators uh, just over the last week and a half. And uh, the bit, or actually uh, two weeks or so, but uh, the, the, the big push that, that we've been telling them is we don't want mail-in ballots. Uh, we don't want any type of gun control. And, and the good news is, is I think any type of gun control being snuck onto there is, is dead. That, that's a dead issue. Uh, but mail-in ballots is still a threat. So Republican senators, and people can go to our website, by the way, and, and see the alert. It's called Pelosi Plotting Trap for Second Amendment Supporters. And it's this threat of mail-in ballots. And so they need to keep hearing from us uh, that, you know, this is something that uh, uh, is just a, an absolute no-go. Not only does it not belong on a, you know, COVID-19 relief bill, it doesn't belong uh, being inserted in federal legislation anywhere. Uh, so anyway, they need to hear from us. I hope people will take action on that because this is a, a, a very important issue, Joel, and it's, it's a tremendous threat that, we, that we're facing right now and we have to address. By the way, I want to point out something you've mentioned twice. Um, when a governor or any elected official says that the Bill of Rights and the Constitution is not something they think about when they institute policy. We have to remember that when they took, when they took office, they took right. an oath in which they, yes. they swore to uphold and defend not only the United States Constitution, but also the Constitution of their state. And the U.S. Constitution is supreme. So if you have a constitution in your state, which goes against the U.S. Constitution, that will not stand. So here's an individual who took an oath when they were when they were sworn in to defend and respect and honor the constitution and then later says, Oh, by the way, I can make these policies. The constitution doesn't matter to me when it comes election time. I think we need to remember that statement and remember that individual because that individual needs to go and, uh, and quickly. And, yeah. and that's the mechanism that the founding fathers gave us to yes. remove such people is the next time that they're elected, we get to remove them. So that means that we have to do this magical thing. You got me on my soapbox here, Eric. I'm sorry. We have to do this magical thing. It's called vote. Vote. The other thing we get to do is we have to defend our vote. So when we're talking about the, these people wanting to steal our votes, the other, was it yesterday or today I saw in the news, I, I, you know, I don't want to tar uh, Alicia Ocasio Cortez with this, but I'm going to, anyway, I'm pretty sure it was her that demand that is now demanding that any new funding bill, relief funding bill that goes through include funds for vote by mail for illegals. First of all, they're not supposed to be voting at all. They're not legally in the country. Wow. Uh, well, who was it? Kamala Harris. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I got another one there. Kamala Harris, who I read uh, yesterday, I think, maybe it was this morning. I don't know. They're all running together. Uh, I'm in the stay at home thing. Uh, that uh, who is now wanting drive by, drive through, drive through voting. Gee, we have drive through everything else. Let's have drive through voting. Just throw your ballot out the window to the ballot harvester or whatever. So this is stuff 
that we have to take seriously and we have to oppose. Otherwise, then our vote won't mean anything because, you know, in the old, in the thirties right. and twenties, they used to talk about stuffing the ballot box. Well, this is the modern day equivalent of stuffing the ballot box with false votes. And if you've got a third party group collecting votes for vote harvesting, who's to say that they don't take out the ones they don't like and only include the ones they do. So there's, there's no mechanism to protect against that. So I think this stuff is, I'm grateful that you guys are opposing this stuff. I really am. You mentioned a few times the, the number of new gun owners, you know, it, the debate seems to go back and forth on social media and, and, uh, among people sending me notes and so on. What do you think? I mean, is it a good thing? I think it's a good thing. The more honest law abiding armed citizens there are out there, the happier I am quite frankly. But from the standpoint of our fight for our second amendment, right. Do you feel that this has been a significant wake up call for these folks? Do you think that they might actually, that the needle might actually move their minds in our direction a little bit? Well, I think so. I think once, uh, and by the way, I've seen this on a personal level, uh, with people who I know that once they become, uh, they shift from believing in, in, uh, controls on guns and you know want to repeal the second amendment and then they their mind is changed on that issue and uh they value uh their right to protect themselves and a lot of times it's uh you know after a uh you know a very dangerous situation or a threatening situation that somebody's been through uh but you see this ripple effect that it affects other issues as well and uh, they do tend to become more conservative. And, and I've seen that many times. So now here you've got a situation where I, I don't know what the actual numbers are in terms of new, I mean, hundreds of thousands of new gun buyers. Uh, now they've got a piece of property that they want to protect. And, you know, it's, it's uh, again, it, it, I would say it's comical, but it's sad uh, at the same time. But I'm reading these articles uh, talking about the, the new gun wave. And, uh, you know, these people, as I was mentioning earlier, they're outraged about all the restrictions and all the hoops they have to jump through. And, uh, you know, the people at the gun store basically saying, well, you know, uh, we didn't vote for the people that made these regulations. Uh, but if you did, uh, then maybe, you know, that's something you should reconsider. And, you know, just trying to gently prod these guys along that or, or gals. Uh, that, you know, you've been part of the problem. You know, if you voted these people in and, you know, you didn't even realize that or maybe you were applauding the restrictions, now you realize how it's coming back to bite you. And, you know, it, it's interesting. It's not just in this country where that sort of aha moment uh, has happened. I mean, you know, Venezuela is a country that's gone from being, a, you know, very rich uh, country, you know, about a decade or, or more uh, ago to being uh, just, you know, in the basement now is there, you know, government, uh, socialist government has just wrecked their, their economy. But one of the, the, uh, so the significant things is they instituted a gun confiscation program uh, within the past 10 years. And it was very effective at, at confiscating guns. And so now their murder rate has skyrocketed. Uh, it got at one point, it was near 100 per 100,000. I mean, that's, you know, maybe 20 times or so higher than the United States, just really terrible. Well, anyway, you started seeing these articles where the Venezuelan people who uh, at one time uh, had supported the gun confiscation policies because they thought it was going to make them safer, now they regret it. And so, thankfully, you know, we're still, you know, in, in the situation we're here in the United States, we still have these freedoms and we're, we're trying to protect the freedoms that we, we, we have. Uh, you know, thankfully, you know, we're not like Venezuela where they lost all their freedoms and now, they, you know, where they're at, it's really hard to get it back. Uh, but, you know, so getting back to your point, yeah, we've got a lot of new uh, gun buyers. Uh, I think it is gonna make a difference. Uh, I think, I really think there's gonna be a big wave. We, we started seeing this in Virginia, as you know, we were very active uh, after the, the past November elections when Virginia went very blue. And it started waking up a lot of people, even a lot of pro-gun Democrats. Uh, and I know that may sound like I'm contradicting what I said earlier. I, I think in the ranks... No, there, there are. I mean, we should, 
probably clarify there, that. There, there are yes. pro-gun Democrats. Absolutely. You can't Absolutely. tar them all with the same brush. There are right. pro-gun Democrats. So what I was saying earlier, they don't tend to get elected to office. Uh, but in the hustings, there are pro-gun Democrats, and a lot of them, uh, and we've seen it in Virginia and other states now, they're enraged by what uh, Governor Blackface Northam has done here, how he tried to uh, pass a confiscation uh, bill uh, here in Virginia. And we started seeing massive outpourings of support at different Board of Supervisor meetings uh, in November, December, January. Uh, Right now, not about 95% of the counties in Virginia have declared themselves as Second Amendment sanctuaries. But what I'm getting at, what, what was interesting is a lot of people were showing up, that they were setting record, uh, record-breaking numbers of people showing up for these Board of Supervisor meetings. It was incredible. I mean, the officials there were, were stunned by how many people were showing up. But we kept hearing over and over people saying, you know, I should have voted uh, in the November election. Uh, I, I think there was a, a large measure of apathy, but one thing we can be thankful to the anti-gun Democrats for, I think they've woken a sleeping giant. They've woken people up, and uh, at least for this coming election, and maybe for a couple elections, I don't think they're going to be asleep anymore, and I think that's a good thing. I would tend to agree with you. You know, you mentioned a, a few things there, and... Um... One of them is the pro-gun Democrat. Now, if you're in California, that's a that's an ex, that, that's extinct. <laughs> that species no longer <laughs> exists, but they they do exist in other places. You know, the the Democratic Party of my grandfather and my great grandfather is not mm -hmm. the Democratic Party of today. It's completely changed. Right. You know, you're looking at so many of the Democrats pushing towards socialism. And if anybody, if you you know if you're watching this and you don't you think socialism is a good idea, as Eric said, all you have to do is look at Venezuela. And you can see precisely what it brings. And Venezuela is not an isolated thing. I'm in my 60s. I can tell you every time I've ever seen socialism applied anywhere, that has been the result. And that will be the result here. So we have to, you know, it, it, I was thinking this morning as I was going through some things that, you know, I used to be very narrowly focused and I just work on my show on the the firearms issue. But the, the problem with that is that there are so many other things that impact our rights, like this a, attempt to do ballot harvesting, like the push for socialism and all these things. Go, eventually, they, they do strip away all of our constitutional rights. And I think people forget that without the Second Amendment, you don't have any of them. You end up losing them all. And that's essentially what's happened in other countries where they don't have a constitutional guarantee of some of these rights. Hey, I'm curious about, uh, with, with regard to the new gun owners, and this this may this may not apply at all, but I'm I'm going to ask you anyway. I've seen a lot of the press now. Anything the press says anymore, I I see I just view as dubious because I have to look at it and go. I don't know. Let me think about that. The press has been touting the fact that the crime rate has gone down in much of the country, and they're saying the reason for that is that people are staying at home. Well, that, that might be true. I, I don't know, but I'm, I'm sure that there's no, that this is anecdotal. I'm sure there's no actual data to prove that. But on an anecdotal basis, I think the other thing that's happened is we now have millions of new gun owners we didn't have before. So if I'm a criminal and I think I'm going to break into somebody's house and they might be home, I know that more of them have guns than before. Do you think that this new gun ownership has had any effect on the lowering of crime? in your opinion, or is it simply that people, what, what the press would want to say, it's simply that people are staying home? Well, and of course, that uh, actually affects the crime rate in, in the sense that uh, the United States has one of the lowest rates of people breaking and entering into a home when there's somebody at home. And when uh, inmates are interviewed and polled, uh, we find that the, the biggest reason why that is is because they're scared of being shot. Uh, so on the other hand, if, if there has been an increase in crime, one of the uh, uh, statistics I've been seeing from around the country is that uh, there's a higher rate of businesses being broken into right now. And that would make sense because with a lot of businesses closed, uh, you know, there again, it follows that you know, they're going to break in somewhere where they don't where they don't fear that, that they're gonna be shot. By the way, in other countries, there's a much higher incidence of break-ins where people are home. And you, know, you, you can connect the dots is because the criminals there aren't as concerned 
about being shot. And of course, that's all the more dangerous because then people, uh, if they are home, can end up being abused, victimized even further. So, uh, so yeah, I, I think all of this uh, ties together. And I think the, the underlying current is that in this country, you at least have 40% of the households uh, that have guns in them. It's probably higher, but that's what the official surveys say. Uh, but I think probably a lot of people don't want to reveal uh, that they're armed. So, you know, let's say half the country, you know, give or take, and now that number is only going higher. Uh, yeah, I'm sure that that has a tremendous deterrent effect. That's an incredible roll of the dice. See, I think I'll break into a house when somebody's home. I got a 50 or 60% chance of getting shot to death doing it. I think maybe that's, yeah, that's a bit of a lucky, deterrent. punk? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Channeling uh, Dirty Harry there. I love it. That's right. <laughs> Uh, okay, a couple of questions for you. I would love you to talk about the court cases a little bit, but before you do, I, I want to mention this because I've, I've said this <laughs> with Sam Paredes on my show before. I will beat this drum until I'm dead. We have to support, if you're watching this right now, this man works his tail off. He's not making millions of dollars a year. I don't know what he's making, but I guarantee he's not making millions of dollars a year. <laughs> One thing, one of the things I love about their organization is they keep it lean and mean, uh, and they just go like crazy and work like crazy, but they need to be supported. And a few different ways we can support them. One is we can, we can actually contribute. We can join, we can contribute it. And it, you know, certainly if you got a lot of money, you contribute a lot. That's a lot. If you contribute a little, that's, that's fine. The, if you got millions of members and they all contribute a little bit, that accounts to for an awful lot of money that these folks need. These lawsuits cost money. They cost a lot of money. The effort of traveling around, attending meetings and, and lobbying like crazy costs money. And so if you're a new gun owner and you didn't like the process, you, you need to join GOA. So I'm going to have a link in the description for you to be able to do that. It's not a terribly expensive thing to do, but every time Eric can send out, send it, can talk to a congressman, senator, or whatever, and say, our millions of members think this. That carries a lot of weight. So joining is important. Contributing is important. And frankly, just contributing some time. Hey, I don't have any money, but I got an hour. What would you like me to do? Would help a lot. So we've got to get off of the couch, away from the video game, away from the TV, grow up a little bit, and start contributing to help these, these, these uh, organizations, particularly Gun Owners of America. So if you're not, uh, I'm going to make you mad here and say, shame on you. I've got a link in the description. And if you don't like the fact that I said that, you can always unsubscribe from the channel. I get it. But, uh, you know, I, I support Eric and you need to, too, because they're doing great work and it's your rights that they're trying to protect. So there you go. I did. You know, and no, they do not support my channel. They do not send me money and they do not pay me. And no, he didn't see. He, he, they did send me a free hat. Okay, but that's because I'm a life <laughs> member. And I'll buy the cup. Thank you very much. I don't want to take money, but I will have a cup the next time we do this one way or the other. All right. Uh, now that I've made my spiel uh, to, I put, in fact, on my little notepad, I wrote funding. <laughs> I can't, I can't say so funding with a bunch of, don't forget that exclamation mark. Let's support uh, GOA, please. And uh, if you don't like me because I said that, well, uh, you're not the first person not to like me. If you <laughs> like me because I said that, thank you very much. I like you too. <laughs> okay. Let's uh, let's join. All right, court cases. We got a bunch of those going on. Tell me what's going on right now with court cases. Well, uh, I mentioned earlier we're involved in Massachusetts and Virginia. Uh, we're challenging the governors there for uh, in Massachusetts for shutting down uh, gun stores, uh, declaring them not to be essential. Uh, in Virginia, gun stores are open, but uh, uh, gun ranges are not, although uh, they are for the police, so go figure. You know, guns for me, but not for the uh, type of situation. So we're challenging uh, both of those. We have a lawsuit uh, in, in Michigan, which actually precedes all the coronavirus. It had to do with the ATF uh, telling concealed carry permit holders that their permit no longer can be used uh, in lieu of the NICS check when they're purchasing a firearm. Uh, several states do allow that, but ATF has been methodically going state by state by state, uh, telling uh, state officials that they'll no longer accept that. And uh, you know the, the, the beauty 
I mean, given the system that we have with background checks, and we talked about this earlier, we oppose them, we, we want to repeal that, but to the degree that we have them, we want that where uh, a person can use their concealed carry permit and, and therefore, uh, you know, remove a potential area of registration where, you know, their name is being sent uh, to the FBI as a gun owner. So, uh, you know, we, we consider, uh, you know, that uh, a, a helpful thing, uh, but ATF's trying to take it away. They've, they've already done it now in three states. So anyway, so we're, we're challenging that. And then, of course, there's, uh, you might say, the big kahuna at the Supreme Court level, a, a New York City case, where uh, there it's very stringent, obviously. Uh, you know, you can, if you want to uh, own and uh, possess a firearm, you have to get a, uh, a permit to do so. And uh, that means you can have it in that location only. So there are seven places in the city that you can take it to, you know, different gun ranges, but uh, it's so strict, you can't even take it out of the city uh, to take it, let's say you have a second home in upper state New York or something like that. So that, uh, those laws, those restrictions are being challenged uh, now at the Supreme Court level. Um, we have an amicus brief that we have uh, put in uh, on that case, which was argued back in December. And basically our contribution was, you know, we don't think there should be any test. Apply, you know, people want to talk, you know, a lot of pro-gunners will want to talk about strict scrutiny versus intermediate scrutiny versus rational basis. But our argument is that the Second Amendment actually has a higher standard, and that standard is shall not be infringed. Brand. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. So, uh, so anyway, that's that's the contribution that we're bringing to this, and and we're pointing out, you know, that this is what was actually discussed in in Heller, uh, in the Heller case. That it was put in terms of history, uh, text, and tradition of the Second Amendment, but they avoided uh, getting into that quagmire of, of different, you know, th three different level tests, and uh, and we think the courts should stay away from that and just apply the shall not be infringed standard. Well, By the I, way, I should say on the New York on the New York City case, we'll probably won't get a decision uh, rendered and publicized till June. That that would be my guess. Well, that's okay. I'm looking forward to it, and hopefully, it goes our way. Because if it does, that'll that'll uh, light off a lot of other lawsuits to clean up some of the mess. Yes. You know, the truth is, if you have to, this is just again, this is just my opinion as an old guy. Okay. When when I have to go before a government entity, I don't care if it's a sheriff or a governor or some bureaucrat in the middle somewhere and genuflect and pay a fee and ask nicely and take a test and go through all the rigmarole to exercise a God-given right, which is guaranteed by the constitution in which our founding fathers wrote the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. I cannot figure out what is so ambiguous about that statement. Right. So we're, we're at a point now where we've allowed this for decades and decades to occur, and now it's time to clean up the mess. So, you know, we have to be, if we're unified, we can do it. If we're fractured, we can't. One of the things that troubles me, and I see it a lot, is the guys who hunt over here care about hunting, but they don't care about self-defense. And the three-gun guys care about three-gun, but they don't care about hunting. And so they don't, we don't generally argue the fact that a violation of the second amendment an infringement on the second amendment over here affects everyone's rights over here and everybody in the middle. And we've got to get on the same page. I'm not a three gun guy, but if you're starting to take away the rights of three gunners to shoot, that offends me because that is part of the second amendment. I am a, right. a hunter, but I have certain things I don't hunt. So if I don't care about this, you, you get where I'm at? I mean, yep. do you see this kind of stuff? This is what I see just knowing people that we get so narrow in our support of the Second Amendment that we lose pieces of it, not realizing that eventually it's going to come catch up with us. Any thoughts? You know, and a lot of, a lot of times it takes a, a, a really a crisis like what we've been going through uh, with this whole slowdown uh, with uh, government officials not going into work uh, like sheriffs and, or the deputies, uh, or closing down certain agencies uh, underneath them. 
and it's caused a real backlog, say, with um, uh, getting concealed carry permits. You know, Gun Owners of America was the first uh, national group back in the 90s. To, back then, it was called Vermont Carry, but, but we were uh, pushing constitutional carry. Even at a time when there was uh, people in the pro-gun movement that thought we were a little crazy for doing that. Uh, <clears throat> but, you know, now I'm so thankful that it has grown into a movement and uh, we have 17 states with constitutional carry where you don't have to ask for permission to carry concealed. Uh, but this was driving people nuts just over the past few weeks, like in Pennsylvania, where sheriffs uh, had shut down their offices uh, out of you know, concern for COVID-19. Uh, they weren't processing applications. And a lot of people, you know, I mean, granted, uh, the, the, the upswing in crime, you know, let's say on the street, et cetera, it hasn't materialized the way a lot of people thought it might. Uh, but people nevertheless wanted to plan ahead. They were concerned. So you had a lot of first time, uh, you know, existing gun owners, but uh, people who'd never had a permit before now applying and, and they simply couldn't get a permit. Actually, some of them uh, are my I have personal friends who were in that category being very frustrated. They wanted to get a concealed carry permit now and, and they couldn't. And I think once again, this just this helps. Uh, illustrate the problem with this whole permission system and why we have to dismantle that uh, and continue uh, pushing constitutional carry, getting that passed in more and more states because we shouldn't have to beg for permission uh, to exercise our rights. And if you're a law-abiding citizen, uh, you know, you should be able to carry concealed. Heck, uh, you know, the, the whole argument that, well, we have to you know, stop the criminals from carrying. They've always carried weapons, no, <laughs> yeah, no, no matter they, what it was. They and don't they buy need, them without a background check, by the way, or a waiting period a or any of this other stuff. Right? Ex exactly. Right. They steal them, whatever, and they carry them. They didn't care that they didn't have a permit. So it's only always ever affected the good people uh, because good people don't want to be on the on the wrong side of the law. So Anyway, in Pennsylvania, by the way, this was a kind of a good news story. Uh, we did a, uh, I did a joint letter with our state director in Pennsylvania. Uh, he's a doctor, and uh, we, we sent that letter to every Pennsylvania sheriff saying, look, you're not following the law. Uh, and being uh, my co-author was a, a doctor, he was able to you know, give suggestions for what they could be doing uh, to, you know, keep safe during this time while still issuing permits. Uh, but then we also activated our, our grassroots in Pennsylvania. And uh, probably a lot of sheriffs aren't used to getting contacted on, on issues like this. Uh, they got hammered uh, in a polite way, but they got hammered. And uh, like one sheriff, uh, the Westmoreland County Sheriff said, wow, uh, we, we really, uh, 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 you know, uh, just got hammered on this. And uh, so they, they started, they opened back up their office, uh, as did many other sheriffs. Uh, they were, you know, they couldn't believe the outpouring uh, that, that was there saying, hey, you know, get started on this. We want to be able to get concealed carry permits. And so we're today in a much better position in Pennsylvania and some other states uh, than at the beginning when there was just this shutdown and and they didn't you know they didn't even want to touch this so anyway some good news items uh, is is always uh, helpful and encouraging I think I think it is too I, I, one thing I would point out is that again I can't speak to the whole country you know more about what's going on with around the country than I do but in San Diego County where I live our sheriff Sheriff Gore does issue permits. He doesn't issue them l as liberally as I would like to I'm using the word liberal here, but you know, in, 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 the, in the way it should be used. And it right. certainly isn't a constitutional carry state. And nevertheless, he continues right. to issue even during this time. But Good. that said, it has become very difficult for people to get their permit because the process is you get approved by the sheriff and then you have to go take the class. Well, I'm one of the instructors and I'm in the I'm in the don't go out and get infected, you'll die group. Right. And so because of age and a couple of health concerns and my wife's health concerns, I don't want to bring back the coronavirus to home. 
I've suspended teaching the courses and I'm not the only one. So now right. these folks have to get a course done. They've got to find a young guy who does, who doesn't, who doesn't mind the risk. Cause he's not going to go spend time with grandma or mom or whatever, who's willing to teach the course. Otherwise they can't get their permit because they can't take the course. So here you're in the middle of a, of not only a natural, a national disaster, but a worldwide pandemic, a natural disaster, and you can't carry a gun. And you're right. Crime didn't take off the way people was afraid. I mean, it didn't get as bad as we thought it might and so on. But I've lived through two natural disasters and two riots. And yeah. I can tell you that when people get panicky, they there's a herd mentality there. Yep. And if you are not armed, you are at the mercy of people who at that moment have none. And here you are, you didn't have a gun before, and now you want to go get one, or you want to get a go permit, and you're a law-abiding American citizen, and you're held back by this idiotic permission slip system, which I agree with you a thousand percent, needs to be torn down. Uh, and I see it in California all the time. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know, you being in California, you know, you've seen this with uh, the riots in Los Angeles. And by the way, same thing happened then where, uh, you know, because of the waiting period on firearms, you had a lot of first-time gun buyers. This was reported in USA Today uh, that were outraged that they, they couldn't uh, show up at a store and buy a gun and, and return home with it on the same day. Uh, because, you know, you remember with the, the riots in Los Angeles, it got really, really deadly and very scary. Well, and uh, LAPD I, left. <laughs> they couldn't yes, handle they it, did. so they, they just left. And the National Guard was just setting up a perimeter and not going in. Yeah, I mean, it, it really uh, it really highlights the fact that, you know, you are, you know, the, the one who's most duty bound uh, to protect yourself and your family. You can't give that over to somebody else. That, that's actually why my family, uh, when I say my family, when I was a kid, uh, my dad bought his first gun. I mean, he'd started off, it's kind of funny to say now, kind of liberal minded and, and, uh, you know, government will protect me. But when he heard uh, a police chief talking about riots in the 60s and how if it happens in the city, they're not going to be able to contain it if it starts going out into the suburbs. Uh, he thought, you know what, um, I, I need to get a gun to protect my family. I mean, it's the same type of thinking that people are going through today, a lot of the right. first time buyers. And so, I actually remember being at the store with them as a little squirt. Uh, They're walking around looking at all the guns and, you know, the, the, this and that. And, and uh, thankfully for him, it was before the 68 Gun Control Act. So he was completely able to buy it off paper, no background check, uh, return home with it the same day. And, uh, and of course, that was uh, the start of his journey. Uh, to becoming a super pro gun. <laughs> yeah, and he did. That's for sure. You know, it, yes. I, I think if you're from California or from a restrictive state and you're watching this, it should, you know, you might be taken aback as a new gun owner and say, well, yeah, but if we do that, but there'll be guns, there'll be gunshots in the street. I got to tell you, there are a lot of states out there with constitutional carry where you don't need a permit. You just have to be a a lawful United States citizen and you can carry, put a gun in your pocket or whatever and go wherever you want with it. And it doesn't right. become Dodge city and people aren't killing each other all of the time, all of the time. There are a lot of States in which you can go in and in, yes, you have to go through the instant background check, which I have problems with as well, but nevertheless, you can walk into the gun store, you can buy the gun and you can leave with it. And there's no background. There's no uh, uh, waiting period. And yet there isn't violence in the street all the time. In fact, those states tend to be safer than the other ones where you have this draconian process in order to buy a gun. I have a concealed carry permit issued by the state of Cal by the San Diego County Sheriff's Department. I think I've had it since 1990. I'm one of the instructors. If I want to go buy a gun, by the way, in this room right here, there's a gun safe right there with several rifles in it, pistols in it, and other things. And there's another one in the garage. Okay, just so that you know. I can you can't have just one safe. I, no, in fact, I, my wife has my wife and I have a rule. If there's a space in the safe, well, we've got to put a gun in that. And if the and if the safe fills up, well, we have to get a bigger safe or another one. I mean, that's kind of how that works. The point is, though, that I, if I go down and buy a gun, I want to go down to the gun store and buy a gun. I have to wait ten days. To pick it up. 
And the, the, the logic behind that is that if you were to give me that gun now, I could go hurt someone with someone with it. Never mind the one I'm carrying on my hip at the time that right. I'm standing in the gun store buying the gun. So this gets back to this nonsense of how this, this really does infringe upon the rights of law abiding, honest Americans. And it, and I, I think if new gun owners become more and more educated, my hope is that they will realize that and begin to oppose some of these draconian laws that have made it so difficult for them to arm themselves and defend their families in the middle of a pandemic. Now, fortunately, they didn't have to defend their families, most of them, I hope. But, uh, but this should be, I hope, a wake-up call for them. And uh, hopefully, you'll have a few more members. I'm going to keep beating that drum, brother. As much as I, can. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Is there anything else you wanted to talk about? I've exhausted my list here. Well, just uh, one comment on what, what you were just saying. Statistically, in regard to constitutional carry, if you look at the six states that have the lowest murder rate in the United States, according to the FBI Uniform Crime Reports, four of those states are constitutional carry states. Um, so, I mean, you know, that right there should tell you that if, if being able to carry a gun without government permission was going to lead to at least how people look at the Wild West, you know, uh, which may be different than the way it actually was. But putting that aside, you know, the, the common misconception of just, you know, gun fights everywhere, you know, et cetera, all the time, every day. Uh, you know, that's not happening in states that have constitutional carry. Uh, they are extremely safe. In fact, I think the old adage that would apply is an armed society is a polite society. And so it's interesting, uh, as, as concealed carry has increased in this country, um, and uh, you know, the Crime Prevention Research Center uh, studies this frequently, uh, the, you know, the, the, the increase in um, concealed carry permits, and of course you can't track uh, how many more people are carrying in the constitutional carry states. So we know that at least over the last, uh, uh, you could say over the uh, Obama administration, uh, there was an increase, 300% uh, increase in just in terms of concealed carry permits uh, alone. And that's not including, uh, as I just said, the uh, you know, people carrying without a permit, but a 300% increase, and yet the murder rate fell during that time. So literally, the, the very thing that you know, John Lott's book says, you know, uh, more guns, less, less crime. crime. We yeah. are seeing that in this country before our eyes. The places where they have more guns, uh, they're, they're actually experiencing less crimes. Where you see, uh, actually, the, the, the greatest danger is in places like Baltimore and Chicago and Washington, D.C., with the very restrictive um, uh, you know, uh, laws in, in terms of ownership and carrying of firearms. And, yeah, you can't and be that's actually, and that, that's where you see the, the, uh, the, certainly the perception of the Wild West. <laughs> you know, it's a, the interesting thing that you mentioned, the armed society, the polite society, that's an old saying. You hear it a lot. Mm -hmm. And people envision one half of that, but not the other half. They envision the half that says an armed society is a polite society because a criminal looks at a potential victim and has no idea whether that individual is armed or not. And right. there's a lot of validity to that. The other part that people miss is an armed society is a polite society because the law-abiding armed citizen knows that if they get involved in a confrontation, they have the potential to kill yes. someone and that could be deadly. And so they're more polite. They tend to put up with more uh, rudeness and more offensive behavior because they know that it could escalate and That's they don't right. want it to escalate. So on the, when you have people who are armed regularly, those people, and we, we know this statistically from concealed carry permit holders, that they are among, if not the most law-abiding people in the nation, precisely because they know that they, they have the power to defend themselves with deadly force. So an armed society is a polite society because of both sides of that. And I'm regularly educating my students in that regard, that when you're carrying a gun, you get to be more polite. You get to be more <laughs> forgiving. You get to be uh, more patient because you're carrying a firearm. So that's, that's both sides of that argument. And I think, I think we need to talk about that other side, that the people who are carrying guns, the reason why it's polite is because they're responsible. We don't talk about that enough. 
Yeah, and I'm glad you raised that. Uh, that's another thing that uh, Crime Prevention Research Center has, has pointed out. Uh, you know, not every state uh, has very detailed information in terms of concealed carry permit holders that uh, commit crimes. But for the states that do, when you compare it to crimes committed by the general public, even crimes committed by police, you exactly what you said, not only um, are uh, concealed carry permit holders more law abiding than the general public, uh, they actually commit crimes at a lower rate than the police do as well. So they, they really <laughs> are the, the most well behaved uh, segment of our society. Absolutely. And, and by the out. way, there's no reason to believe that the permit had anything to do with that. Right. The fact that they have that, a permit, there's no reason to believe that it's a just person simply a way of documenting it, but you're, you're absolutely right. Right. Let's not, let's not uh, jump to the conclusion that because they have a permit, that's the way they feel. No, that yes. applies to people who carry on the constitutional carry states that don't need a permit. They're still right. among the most law abiding people on in the country precisely before the reason that I mentioned, they know that escalating things can cause, you know, they're going to end up killing somebody. And if any, they'll go out of their way to walk away, apologize, whatever the case might be, because they don't want that to happen. So that's part of that. I think the other thing I wanted to mention too, is you, you brought this up in a different way, but this is something I think we get to learn as gun owners. We, my father was a deputy sheriff. I was a security contractor, owned a security company, we did uh, explosives and narcotics detection with canine teams. And, you know, we, we own a security training company. So I've been around law enforcement a lot and first responders a lot. We call them first responders, but they're not. At best, they right. are the second responders. Yes. You and I, when we are being threatened, when our life is being threatened, when we are, when, when the lives of our loved ones are being threatened, we are the first responders. That's right. And we either respond or we don't. And we either have the ability to respond or we don't. And then the second responders show up to generally not to save you or me or our family, but to clean up the mess and then figure out who did it. Law enforcement oftentimes is, an, I, they would love to be there to protect everyone, but they can't be. Most of the time they are an after the fact agency. The issue occurs, somebody is killed or injured, they show up afterwards, they clean up the mess and they try to figure out who did it so that they can go arrest that person incarcerate them, pro prosecute them, get, you know, set up some, a nice case for the Commonwealth attorney or the district attorney or whatever but they're not standing there. What is the old saying? The reason I carry a gun is because I can't fit a cop in my pocket. You and I are the first responders. We need to get out of the mindset that the first responders are government agents. And I would carry that even further and say, you know what? I have some medical training. Why do I have some medical training? Because I'm the one on scene. And if something happens with my wife or my children, I'm the first responder. EMS is going to come with better medical training and help and transport them to the hospital, but I better know some basic things. Otherwise, they might expire before the, the help shows up. We've got to get out of this mindset that we assign the responsibility for our own welfare and our own safety and our, the safety and welfare of our family to government agents and call them the first responders. They're not. We are. And we've got, to, right. stop, we got, we got to stop giving up that responsibility and take it back. That's for, for thousands of years, human beings have faced death from disease and, and uh, violence and so on. And they were always there to take care of themselves and prepare for themselves. I hope this pandemic has woken people up where that's concerned too. We are the first responders and we need to act as that way. And we need to make sure our rights are intact so that we can. Yeah, and thanks to uh, Obama's CDC, we know that actually a lot of people take that responsibility seriously. Uh, anywhere, uh, according to CDC surveys, anywhere from 500,000 to 3 million times a year, people are using guns in self-defense, which by the way, means that, any, uh, that anywhere from 16 to 100 times more often, guns are being used to save and protect life than to take life. So, um, you know, despite all the, the rhetoric of the left and you know they only they just love to focus on the negative uses of firearms it's actually far you know far more times guns are being used positively for the exact uh reason that you just said because we are the first responders 
and there you are. And with that, I don't have anything else to add, Eric. How about you? You got anything else you want to close with? Uh, no, well, I just uh, thanks so much for for having me on, Joel. Uh, thank you for what you're doing and and keeping everybody uh, informed uh, and you know with action links and things like that. Uh, we really appreciate it because uh, that just helps. You know, it just helps get more people engaged. So thank you very much. You're quite welcome. Thanks for being on the show, Eric. It's always a joy, and I really do appreciate you taking the time. Have a great week and stay safe. Thank you. You too. Uh, boy, if you stayed through the entire interview, you're really a gun supporter. So I'm really grateful. Thank you very much for hanging out with us and uh, staying the entire time. Please do support Gun Owners of America. There is a link in the description, and they can certainly use your support. If nothing else, join and then subscribe to their email alerts so you know when and where you can pitch in and fight for your Second Amendment rights. Have a great week, and wherever you go, whatever you do, please be safe.